team for representatives of the FERC, which I think we're all here. All right, all right, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the December 14th Site Plan Review Committee uh, subgroup for Google Site. We'll be holding a hybrid uh, public meeting which enables remote electronic participation as legally authorized by the Code of Virginia for Planning Commission's electronic review policy adopted on July 7th, 2022. Members of the SPRC subgroup for Google Site are participating both here and in person and virtually through the electronic. Microsoft team links provided at the SPRC webpage, the project webpage, the county's events calendar, and the email notification sent to SPRC email subscribers. Additionally, there's a dial-in phone option for those who wish to use it. For our subgroup members joining virtually, if anyone loses internet connectivity during today's meeting, please reconnect with us by phone. Please keep your phones and devices muted until you are called upon. Turn off sound to any other devices around you to minimize interference. For our virtual attendees of Microsoft Teams, please turn off your video feed. I will address when it's appropriate to turn it on in a moment. The Microsoft Teams meeting chat is active to serve two purposes only. The SPRC subgroup members who need technical assistance and for members of the public who add their names to the list for public comment, which will be taken at the end of the meeting. The Teams chat should not be used for discussion. Those we're planning to provide public comment. We'll need to do so at the end of the meeting. That will not serve as that opportunity as of that point. All public comments must be shared verbally for the record during the assigned public comment period. Um, if subgroup members participating virtually wish to be recognized to speak on an item during the course of the meeting, please turn on your video feed and raise the virtual hands and teams. I will monitor the video feeds that are on as an indicator of who would like to speak. If subgroup members are participating by a phone today without video option, please announce your name and group you are representing now, and I will verbally check in to see if you wish to be recognized as you do not have video feed options. I can call it, right? Um, for members of the public who would like to provide feedback and comments, you will be called on to speak at the end of the meeting and will be allotted two to three minutes to speak on the agenda item. The speaking time allotted will depend on the number of speakers we have this evening. If you wish to speak, please enter your name in the meeting chat for virtual attendees and provide staff with your name if in person, and you will be added to the speakers list. Lastly, this is a public forum. Today's meeting will be recorded and posted on the county website. All information associated with today's meeting, whether written or spoken, is subject to Freedom of Information Act requirements. Okay, that is our functional Roll. We're done. So I am Leo Sarley of the Planning Commission, and I am co-chairing this SPRC with my colleague Peter Robertson. Hey, Adam. Adam, what, what do you represent? Sorry, Forest Street Natural Resources Commission. Thank you. John McIntyre, Climate Change, Energy, and Environment Commission. Catherine Malloy, Goodwill of Greater Washington. Dawn Holland, Goodwill of Greater Washington. And Van Hine, Forest Street Advisory Committee. Jim Lantelmi, Planning Commission. Tony Strider, Planning Commission. Alex Sanders, Parks and Recreation Commission. Michael Foster, MTFA Architecture, on behalf of the applicant. Andrew Painter, Zoning Attorney with the law firm of Walsh Colucci, also on behalf of the applicant. Josh Childs with AHC. Robert Gibson, Arlington County, DES Transportation. Planning Division. Great, let's go around. Aaron Shriver with the Planning Commission. Philip Dench with MTF Architecture. Great. Um, and then back here. Andrea Walker uh, with uh, Pam Van Hine, a Pedestrian Advisory Commission. Perfect. Thank you. Ian Bagley. Oh, I already went. I assume you go again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a different person. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Apologies. <laughs> you can. Oh, online. I guess, I guess I will start. I do Muradovich. I'm with the uh, Transportation Commission. Uh, I wish I could be in person, but I'm getting over a cold, so better for me to stay here. Thank you. Welcome. We'll go ahead. Uh, Eric Berkey, Planning Commission. Okay. Uh, Jeff Cole with Goodwill of Greater Washington. Nikki Blake, Housing Commission. 
I'm Jeff Kreps with VICA. We are the civil engineer and landscape architect. I'm Alan Goldstein, also with AHC. Okay. Mike Pinkowski with VICA, I'm transportation planning. Uh, Chris Kreider, urban design in the planning division. Steve Kleppin, Arlington Heights Civic Association. And then Mr. Byrne. Are you there, Mr. Byrne? You did. Yeah, well, Dr. Byrne um, representing um, Buckingham Community Civic Association. Um, all right, welcome everyone. Um, and now I turn it over to Seth. All right. Um, so good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin Lamb with the Planning Division. And tonight I'll be providing a presentation on behalf of staff for the Goodwill Site Plan Project. I will note that my presentation will be based on the plans as submitted, but please acknowledge that the applicant has been working closely on updates and changes that will be reflected in their presentation. So in parts of my presentation, I'll defer to, to their latest uh, plan set. Uh, but tonight, uh, I will go over the three main SPRC topics for discussion. Uh, which is land use and density, site design and layout, and then building height form and architecture. And then within the topic of site design and layout, I did want to highlight three major issues staff identified during our review. Um, these include site access and circulation, which is related to the different users and various uh, vehicular activities occurring at the site. We have the Glebe Road frontage, so this is how the building engages the Glebe Road streetscape. And then we have the off-ramp frontage, which is related to the trail improvements along this um, streetscape. So for context, the site is located at 10 South Glebe Road in the Alcova Heights neighborhood. Uh, the site is also located outside of a special planning area and therefore not subject to a sector or area plan. And currently the approximately 1.3 acre site is occupied by the existing Goodwill uh, Retail and Donation Center, uh, some surface parking, and then we have the uh, existing exterior drop-off zone for donations. But the GLOP designation is a uh, service commercial, and the applicant is requesting a rezoning from R6 and C2 to the CO190 uh, mixed use district, which is consistent with the service commercial glove designation. Uh, so tackling the first topic for discussion uh, in terms of land use and density, the applicant is proposing a new six story mixed use development for a total density of 2.95 FAR which includes 1.95 FVR of bonus density they'll need to earn. The project will consist of a larger Goodwill uh, retail and donation processing center, which will be located on the bottom two floors of the building. Uh, it'll also include 128 affordable units, which will be located above the Goodwill. And then we also have a childcare facility located in the rear so based on the plans as submitted, the project will include 168 parking spaces, which will be located both in a surface lot as well as an underground parking garage. So in terms of site design and layout, um, here is the first floor plan. So given the proposed site regrading and topography, uh, the first floor does not have street level entrances on Instead, the entrances on Glebe are actually located on the ground floor, which sits below the first floor shown here. But the first floor does meet the street level along the off ramp located here. 
So the site includes a single vehicular access point on Glebe Road in the form of a shared curb cut with the adjacent property to the south. A shared driveway provides access to the uh, surface parking area as well as the queuing lane, which slopes up um, to the first floor and then back around down to the ground level. The shared driveway also provides access to the underground parking garage located in the rear, as well as access to the uh, loading and trash area here. So there are a variety of users and activities occurring at the site listed here. So they include you know, obviously the residents. There's going to be resident pickup and drop off. There are retail customers, donation drop offs, child care pickup and drop off semi-trucks for donation shipments, and then the loading and trash activities. <laughs> so due to the you know, proposed site regrading and the limited street frontage on Glebe Road, staff do have concerns about potential areas of conflict between vehicles and pedestrians. So for instance, uh, let's look at area one here, which presents potential pedestrian vehicular conflicts between Vehicles entering the site from Glebe Road, uh, vehicles entering and exiting the service parking area. We also have vehicles entering this uh, space to access the queuing lane. And then we also have pedestrians using this crosswalk to access the building entrances. And then looking at area two, this area also has different users navigating this small space, such as loading trucks, vehicles entering and exiting the underground parking garage. And then we have uh, vehicles exiting the drop off area. So the next issue uh, has to do with the building being disconnected from Glebe Road. So currently, um, as proposed, there is a 73 foot setback between the building and the Glebe Road sidewalk. Um, not only that, within this building setback, there are two rows of surface parking, a two-way drive aisle, as well as a retaining wall for portions of this frontage that reaches a maximum height of seven feet. So the surface parking, as well as the drive aisles that separate the building's residential and retail entrances over here with the Glee Road sidewalk really detract from the pedestrian experience, experience and environment. So in this case, staff recommends the applicant consider design revisions that address both the vertical and horizontal separation between the building and Glee, uh, such as the removal of any unnecessary pavement in this area, as well as having a more engaging and connected building frontage. So one design change staff does recommend is removal of these surface parking spaces for a variety of reasons. And just kind of going back to this previous slide, which will kind of illustrate you know, the, the, the benefits of removing this parking. Um, it eliminates the scenario where cars kind of coming onto the property, see there is parking in the space, Maybe it is available, maybe that it isn't, but they'll just kind of stop here. Maybe they'll turn in, not see any parking, and then turn out again. Um, instead, if there is no kind of teaser parking, cars would just go straight back to the underground parking garage. It also eliminates the conflicts between cars backing out of these spaces and cars entering this queuing lane. It also reduces the number of cars that would theoretically enter this area in uh, conflict with pedestrians using the crosswalk. Kind of most importantly, you know, given all of these vehicular activities in this small area, it reduces the potential for backups onto Glebe Road impacting traffic. Got a bit wonky there. So this 
kind of last issue that staff identified um, has to do with the off ramp frontage and trail improvements. However, the applicant has been working on expanding the width of this trail to meet the recommendations of the Arlington Boulevard trail study. So I will defer to their presentation for the latest plans. But just going through what they previously submitted, um, this top section shows the proposed streetscape, which was a five foot sidewalk slash trail and a five foot buffer with the off ramp. So an overall width of 10 feet. Plus, there's also this retaining wall for some of that frontage. And then this bottom section shows the street, streetscape as recommended by the trail study. And this red line represents the Goodwill property line in relation to, the, to these sections. So for the trail study, the preferred design concept includes an overall 21 foot trail width, which includes an 11 foot trail and then two five foot buffers on either side. So as you can see, in order to implement this preferred design trail, um, the Goodwill property would need to accommodate additional space on their site for this. However, the study also explores another you know, less ideal option that has an overall 16 foot uh, section instead of the 21 foot section. So this 16 foot section is something that applicant has been working towards, and they will be showing in their presentation shortly. So moving on to the third and final topic, which is building height, form, and architecture. The, build, the building main roof height is around 70 feet, exclusive of the 10 foot mechanical penthouse at the top. The development is uh, six stories tall, as measured from the average site elevation. And architecturally, the building is rectilinear. It follows the, the narrow dimensions of the property you can kind of see in the ski plan. Uh, but again, the applicant has been working on changes to the architecture, which they will show as part of their presentation. Uh, but these elevations uh, kind of show what was previously submitted. So we have uh, the two story podium, which consists of a charcoal masonry face with some storefront windows along the lead and a metal wrap canopy along this frontage. Uh, the Glebe Road, as well as the off ramp facades, included an offset window pattern with some Juliet balconies, some light wood tone cement board siding, and then also blue cement board panel accents. And this northern building corner shown here um, also included contrasting features consisting of light cement board panels, some step out balconies, and then some additional metal canopy accents. And these are the remaining facades, so the reader side. Um, these ones included a uniform window pattern and some Juliet balconies, um, but then a uh, medium wood tone siding. So just to wrap things up, in terms of community engagement, we did host an online feedback opportunity uh, late October, early November, where we had 167 uh, participants. So a summary of the responses has been posted to the project webpage, uh, but I can just say, you know, overall, most respondents agreed that the proposed uses, the density and the height are appropriate, with many supporting the affordable housing and charter uses in particular. Many also expressed concerns about the auto-oriented layout of the site, how vehicular circulation will work in an effective manner, and the potential impacts to traffic on Glebe Road. And then meanwhile, comments on architecture was mixed with some respondents expressing concerns about the retaining wall and would support a wider streetscape on both Glebe mm -hmm. as well as a off ramp. So here we are in the process. The next second SPRC meeting is scheduled for January 18th. Which will cover the following topics listed here, kind of the standard ones. And in order to support the applicant's affordable housing uh, application deadlines, we are targeting a February public hearing. Um, so it is a bit accelerated, but 
know. Hopefully we can work through these issues um, over the next couple months. And then uh, with that, that concludes that presentation. I'll hand it off to Af Affairs. Thank you, All right, Mr. Lamb. Um, so, uh, again, my name is Andrew Painter. I'm a zoning attorney at the law firm of Walsh Gallucci. We are working with AHC and Goodwill of Greater Washington on this. Um, I have a few prefatory remarks. Uh, we're going to zoom through a couple of the earlier slides because Mr. Lamb did a really good job of, uh, of going through um, sort of the basic background, the zoning site area, that sort of thing. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. First, this is a very unique project. Um, it is a partnership between uh, two nonprofit organizations that have served this county for decades. Uh, Goodwill of Greater Washington uh, and AHC, which is the county's largest affordable housing provider. Um, the planning for this project, at least on Goodwill side, has been going back for at least four plus years. Um, as will come out, I'm sure, in the conversation, uh, this is uh, a 1954 vintage building. Uh, it is the oldest building in the uh, Goodwill system. It is also the most heavily used and largest amount of donations of all of the 20 plus Goodwill locations uh, in the DC metro area. Um, if you've gone out there on a Saturday, you know that the queuing can, can take a while. Uh, it backs up on, up on the Glebe Road. Uh, it is auto-centric because that's how people are, are predominantly donating things um, today. And there's a lot of traffic conflicts. Um, what we're trying to do here, there's really three principal aims. The first one is retention of this nonprofit organization at this location, but an improved uh, visitor and donation experience improved efficiency uh, from a, um, a donation and retail uh, experience for uh, its employees, and then also reducing queuing on South Beach Road and the off-ramp to Arlington Boulevard. Um, the second aim is realizing an all affordable housing project here at this location. Uh, and the third, of course, is expanding access to child care services, uh, which are key aims of the county's policies. Um, this is, again, an extraordinary partnership between these two organizations. Uh, the leadership for both is here tonight. Uh, and in the room tonight, just so that you know, is Catherine Malloy. Uh, again, she's the president and CEO of Goodwill Greater Washington. Uh, Don Holland, who's right next to her, is the vice president for donations and retail. She has all the expertise about how things work on site, um, you know, the queuing, uh, the drop-offs, the amount of time it takes between drop-offs, et cetera. She has all of those uh, details memorized. Um, the application that is before you tonight, as Mr. Lamb said, has changed slightly since, or significantly since we originally submitted um, and the changes that Mr. Foster is going to show you really do reflect um, several meetings with staff and the applicant, uh, dozens upon dozens of staff comments, uh, as well as uh, the 800, approximately 800 comments that we received during the online engagement process. Um, so there's been a lot of good things. A couple that I just want to highlight. Um, along Glebe Road in that frontage, uh, you saw the two rows of service parking. One of those rows has been eliminated, the row that is next to Glebe Road. So we'll show you what that looks like. And our thought is to recapture that space for landscaping and hardscaping improvements, uh, have an improved bus shelter experience, uh, but also make it kind of a gateway to Alcova Heights as you come down um, the road from, from, uh, from Boston. Uh, we've made changes to balconies, uh, window alignments, exterior material elements. Uh, we have also been able to find a way, working with staff, to accommodate a wider bicycle section for the Arlington Boulevard multi-use trail. So we're happy with that. Uh, and then last but not least, we were able to find a way to provide direct pedestrian access to childcare, which is at the back side of the building. And that was another request of staff. Um, we have set up a series of weekly meetings with staff. And I want, my, I want to express my sincere appreciation on behalf of our project team for staff's work on this. We're all trying to find a way to get to yes on what is a very difficult, challenging site topographically, size-wise, and just shape-wise, but also the fact that it's at a key intersection with a lot of traffic, both vehicular and pedestrian. Um, so I'm going to stop you know, yammering around. We can go through all of this right now. Oh, one of, could we go one more real quick? I do want to highlight one thing here, um, the total number of units. So 128 units, all affordable. 
But take a look at the breakdown of that. Um, approximately 73% of that are either two or three bedroom units, which we know is a priority for the county to house families and larger household sizes. So I just wanted to, to mention that. So with that, Michael, uh, take it away. If you don't mind, I don't have a pointer. So if somebody can track. Thank you, thank you very much. We've been working on this for a couple of years and Goodwill has been working on it for years, more than that. And from the very beginning, we really wanted to understand how do we take this unique site and address the values of wellness, trauma-informed, urban design, planning, environment, biophilia, site safety, and these have been the driving principles. We can go through as many or a few of those in question and answer afterwards. Next slide. As you know, on this site, there's two curb cuts and absolute chaos of asphalt and traffic on it. But with those challenges, a brilliant team for Goodwill has made this one of the most successful sites in their system. And most of that is because it is at the intersection of a very generous donor base in Arlington and a large community of great need. And with thousands and thousands of cars, somebody said it's car centric. It is. And that's the key to the success. And it's been that way for a long time. And of those cars, very few come. Um, that our very few donors come without a car because they just don't carry it on the bus or on bike. So what we wanted to do is get rid of most of the asphalt and give it a counterclockwise circulation as safe as possible, limiting it to one curb cut and a very conventional uh, right end counterclockwise uh, movement and as Kevin said, excellent presentation. That was where this project started. And since then, many changes, including mitigating the retaining walls by terracing landscapes here, getting rid of this row of, of uh, parking so that all those retaining walls that are steep could be terraced down, no rail, it's all landscape terraced. It, it, improved sight lines for safety and took the entire 10 foot trail without the retaining the, the severe retaining walls and a full landscape buffer for the 16 foot option in doing that we got rid of the sidewalks here tightened this up and created ada access between daycare and pedestrian entrance on both sides of the building. Uh, by doing that, we are doing an elevated um, uh, crosswalk so that it emphasizes pedestrian over vehicle. Um, that, the, that this does allow queuing to start here, where before the queuing went out into the road. And this, because it was one car at a time, and we set this with multiple lanes, multiple cars at a time. That increases the two and a half to four minutes to unload a car for a car and increase that pace 400% by having uh, the, to mitigate that delay. It's a gradual ramp, if I even that up, you know, uh, the cross sections have been up there. So those. Uh, so the retaining wall has been reduced. At this location, then by getting rid of these cars, we have um, are in this location. We have a very a terraced landscape, not a retaining wall in that location. And an enlargement of this along the um, along the off ramp is a continuous, not tree grades, continuous buffer of four feet, a full twelve foot bike trail, a two foot transition, and then by terracing that, we mitigated most of the retaining wall. In this three feet, we are gonna plant so that we have biophilia 
and a green wall along that charcoal masonry north face. As you can see here, the section of this, but the, the, the site terraces down and out of a retaining wall, and it mitigates the height of the retaining wall, which is inverse in this location. The section and the landmarks are here and here show that the bulk of the first floor is fully underground. And what's important to know from a planning standpoint that really controlled many grades is this property line on the west side is shared with our neighbor and a shared drive easement to reduce asphalt on both sides. But they have an ongoing commercial operation and we really can't move the grade. Um, the landscape, the floor plan is an orienting entry for the retail operation and orienting entry for the affordable housing a primary pedestrian way, and that we limited this now to both ADA and a minimal amount of parking because ADA extends beyond people with disabilities of, of mobility. Um, but there are certain anxieties that do not allow you to park in the garage. So it's really for uh, to accommodate the values of all people. We made the parking, the loading dock uh, discreet in the back, which, re which is requires off hours, trucks pulling in, packing around, and then two way traffic off to the side. So it's discreetly hidden around back. Excellent. Um, the next level up, as Kevin said, now comes up buffer between a landscape, um, a biophilia wall, and the trail. Coming in here with two lanes of drop off, and then a this is stop and go, but this is a smooth operation back out. And again, this is a managed loading dock, so we will not have truck conflicts. And anytime there is, there'll be a person on site to handle it. But most of the deliveries are um, when the drop off is not open or the daycare is not open. The unit plan lays out well, and you can see we have multiple stacks of generous three bedroom units and 73% multi bedroom. The upstairs parking garage is a very orienting and uh, down to two levels uh, that below grade. As you can look in the section, we had to skinny this up to the very bare minimum in order to get the, uh, the full trail width. And landscape buffer and circulation for this operation. Uh, for the longitudinal section, you can see a very generous or a very gradual ramp up and um, a little bit steeper ramp down with the community room overlooking the county in that location. Um, we want to thank all of you for the 800 comments and 167 <laughs> because we've read all of them and they have helped us. So sincerely, thank you. And we've gotten about 95% of it, probably 99%, not perfect. We got a lot of them so that we uh, cleaned up the order of the windows. We now have a skin that's 28, 29% glass, which is a good ratio for natural light, wellness, and energy envelope. We wanted to give it some movement, but also break down the scale and texture in a more natural environment. This wall would be lined with trees on one side and a green wall on the other. Two stories of glass so that even the retail residential, we wanted to give it a presence on the road. So we've been the big processing center, the employee break room, team room, training conference is animated and a fitness center. It's the second floor of the uh, residential, um, which makes it orienting to its concerns about cars coming in and the spaces. As you can see, them, what we've often done in this intersection is even a, a technology related, you know, three spaces left, two spaces left, zero spaces left, don't bother, <laughs> and a big place time with parking here. 
uh, this publication is not about signage. It will be regulated under a different process. Um, approaching it from the west, we wanted to do a, a masonry retaining wall for acoustic and private separation from the playground translation into a powder coat of aluminum fence, jumping it up to the landscape and the natural buffer uh, beyond and have a safe and comfortable buffer expressing probably about 50% of this building is masonry with, a, um, uh, with about 50% a sustainable phenolic panel of cement board and engineered system uh, for the skin and vibrancy. And I think that's, uh, I said I would be finished on schedule and under yeah. budget. So I thought you'd be done. Mm -hmm. We'll answer all your questions. And I'm sure you have plenty of Great. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Jeff and Doctor, for the presentation. Andrew, for the uh, explanatory words. All right. The, um, the meeting now is with the committee. Um, feel free to remind me of your name and who you're representing. I tend to forget, so I apologize in advance if I stare at you blankly trying to figure out <laughs> to call your name. Fortunately, I have a list. But with that, I think the subjects, as Kevin mentioned earlier on, um, that we'll be discussing are land use and density, site design and layout. Under site design and layout, we have site activation, we road frontage, off ramp frontage, and then the third point is building height, form, and architecture. Are there any additional points that anyone wants to add before we talk about um, that do not fit under these three? Okay, we'll get started then. Land use and density. Any questions or comments? Any concerns with the amount of units or the U then? I just want to implement the applicant two and three bedrooms. We don't usually see that. We back. Stuff. Yes, yes, I agree. Yes, Tony. Not 100% affordable, sir. That's great. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll get, we're begging for like two right. the building, so this is great. Right. Great. Um, thank you, Aaron. Um, let's go with Mr. Byrne first. Um, yes. Uh, the, um, I'm going to say that this building is really much too big. Sorry, Bernie, we cannot hear you. You can't? Okay. I'm on, you I'm on speak up. You're, it's very muffled, so your microphone is on, but it's just very difficult to make out what you're saying. Oh, it's off again. It's off. <laughs> I think that he's probably got to change it to headset from a built-in mic. It looks like he's wearing a headset. <laughs> Right, but Teams Teams is probably listening for yeah. the audio with the built-in microphone. Yeah. Hey, Bernie, so you are muted now. If you can unmute yourself, and then. Um, okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? now? <laughs> yes. Clearly. Okay. 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 Your speakers are on, or, uh, but it's just we can screen. hear you, but we just can't make out what you're saying. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? It's not a it's not a volume <laughs> problem. It's just uh, a muffled what? problem. It's a what? What? It's just muffled, Bernie. Uh, we just can't make out what you're saying. We can hear you. We just can't make out. Would it be possible for you to type your comments? Um, okay. Can you hear me now? So, yes, no, Bernie, no. we can hear you. It's not a volume problem. It's just very muffled. Okay. Um, I guess I'll, 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 I'
And I recommend uh, someone recommended here that you take off the earphone and the, and the microphone and try just the laptop or the computer uh, microphone. Is that possible? The computer microphone doesn't work. work. Uh, okay. It's, 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 I think I have to have the microphone. All right, let's do this. Why don't you speak a little slower and articulate as if we didn't speak your language? Okay. okay. Now, now, the building, the building is, is occupying too much, too much space, space on, the on the ground. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. The, 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 building, the building should take up space, 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 space and be and small. Be uh, uh, there's, there's very little green space, space, space at the ground, at the ground level. level. Further, further. There's, 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 there's no green roof or, or, or no solar panels on the roof. And I don't and understand, I don't why, understand why, they why they can't be used instead of wind. Uh, the, 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 the ground level has very little space. Very little space for colonies. Uh, and it's just using up too much uh, ground space. It could be taller. Hey, Bernie, I'm going to interrupt you one more time. So we're discussing land use and density. So I, I think you mentioned solar panels, if I heard you correctly. Right, right. Um, so I think we'll get to those points probably at the next meeting. But today we're talking about land use and density right now. And we're going to. The big thing is, is if the land use is too much occupancy by the site, by the building. And not enough of the at the ground, ground level. level. Okay, so site also, also that, 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 I, I think I think that there's a wall that's built, and that's not really the wall. Right. Is okay, thank you. Thank you, Bernie. I apologize for my microphone. No problem. Glad you could make it. Uh, Commissioner Berkey. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, would it be okay if I move? A little loud there. Would it be okay if I ask questions, questions about the about use of the building? building? Absolutely. Okay. So two questions. First is, will there be some type of community room or, or something for the residents? Yes. Yes. There will be. So, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Miss, I missed that in the materials. Second question. Um, no, you know what? I'm going to hold off on the second question. I just want to make the statement um, that I agree with Mr. Painter's um, uh, you know, assertion about this being an ambitious uh, project. Um, I think it is. Uh, I think the level of density is appropriate. Um, we dearly need affordable housing and co-location of affordable housing with other uses, um, in my opinion, is going to be one of the most viable ways moving forward with the cost of land uh, in our county. Um, I think the location is also ideal because um, it's very close to a middle school and an elementary school, and there's a lot of parkland, and eventually, hopefully, we get this trail going on the south side of Route 50, along with the one that already exists on the north side of 50 it's near Ballston. Um, so I think there's a lot of things to really like, and with, with four uses, retail, child care, um, the, you know, the drop-off, the collection site, and the residential. So I'll have a lot of other questions, but I just wanted to kind of put my thumb on the scale and say I, I really applaud the ambition. Um, these are the types of projects that uh, that our community needs. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And, and if I could just, you know, just say, you know, I think um, Mr. Foster mentioned that that community room will be on the top floor. Um, and there's two yeah. of them. Um, and Mr. Charles can talk about it. And from an open space perspective, we do have a 5,500 square foot uh, outdoor area, outdoor play space for the child care. We have increased the amount of landscaped open space by getting rid of that front so, sort of section of, of parking. Um, and uh, we have also increased our treescape uh, on the property too, but we can talk about that more at the next meeting. Yeah. I, Do you want me to get into the site design? Or, yeah, sorry. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Eric, for the questions. Josh with HC. Um, as Michael said, we do have two separate spaces. Uh, after zoning, we'll do design development to sort of uh, finalize it all. But um, when HC went internally and talked to our resident services folks, we learned um, that they like having resident services near the entrances to kind of get like foot traffic and people who maybe didn't hear about the event or whatever. Um, but we also knew for our residents and their experience on an admittedly tight site um, that 
we and I've toured some of our peer nonprofit developers uh, with really effective like fresh air spaces and kind of elevated community rooms. So on the top floor of our residential space, forget which slide it's on. Next one. Uh, that pop out there is sort of that's the deviation from the regular sort of floor plan is these two units uh, on the top floor kind of final design TBD, but it'll have um, like an open air balcony and and um, on a tight site, a space for people to get out and have fresh air and smell Arlington Boulevard. Um, and <laughs> whatever they want to do on the common space. Um, but that was something that was really important to us as uh, HC started to become a partner in this. Uh, in this redevelopment was to make sure we had a variety of spaces that our residents could use. Great. Thank you, Mr. Josh. Which Josh. I Thank you. All right. Um, any other comments on land use and density? Tony? Would the trail fit in that category? Uh, let's, let's put that on site design and layout, especially if it's Mr. Yeah, good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we have an online Mr. Steve Kleppen for the Arlington Heights Civic Association. Mr. Kleppen, the mic is yours. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Sorry, I don't have my uh, camera on right now. Um, first, just want to recognize uh, the you know, creative use and update of the, the aging building and a very useful mix of units for families and thank you for uh, your work with the community to update the plans uh, specifically redesigning the retaining wall and sidewalk width which was a concern for, for some of our community in Arlington Heights um, for density we, we did have a question of whether the, the county had done a um, student population creation like how much is this going to tax the, the schools as far as the density and, and how many students that's going to create so that will be done um, in time for the board report. So we are reaching out to our partners in APS to help generate that student generation report. Um, like you said, there are 100 new units at this site, which you know will have an impact on uh, local schools. So that those numbers will be generated. Yep. Thank you. Yes, OK, great. Thank you. Just, just one more quick question, if, if I have the time. Go ahead. Um, as far as site use, maybe this falls into it. Um, some of our, our members had raised kind of just the fact that it, it's a bit of a, a concrete jungle. I, I know there's a county um, statute about kind of green space and access to that per, per population. I'm guessing uh, what we're using is the TJ Park across um, Glebe Road as that outdoor green space for them. Um, if that's the case, it's a fairly busy road to, to take uh, regularly, especially young kids. And um, so part kind of part one of that question and then part two is probably easier question. Is that child care outdoor space available to residents or is that just members that are paying for that child care? You want to handle that? Sure, sure. Um, we have talked to a couple of child care providers already who are excited. I would say that the details would be kind of final and preliminary now, but our intention is that after daycare hours and on weekends, uh, that that's a, a community amenity for, for our residents, yeah. We want to have that in the site plan conditions, though. Mm -hmm. We have that. We can do that. Other sure. Right. Block right. from here, we have that. Yeah. Uh, but it, to keep it there, you know, it should be part of the site plan conditions. Great. Uh, Mr. Klepper, are you done? Yes, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just a follow up question on the, the uh, students. Doesn't I thought CPHD had its own trip generation? Or, uh, its own student generation factor uh, schedule uh, is that has that always been something that APS has provided in the staff reports, or is it, it okay? It's strictly coming out of APS. We okay. provide the inputs, and they kind of do the calculations based on their own internal formulas. And I think they update their formulas every year. Okay, so, so, do you work with so those are not CPHD. The, the student generation um, tables are not CPHD driven. They they come from APS. Correct. Okay, I guess I've always 
assumed that those were county staff numbers, but it's good to know that we're not doing double work. <laughs> but I, I think for the, the the to make sure that the person who made the comment knows that the, 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 the neighborhood knows this that that there is a standard set of formulas under which we can forecast using very robust statistical data uh, the number of students um, usually to a tenth that a new unit based on its size are, is going to contribute to, uh, to the counties, to the, the school system. And and we say to the 10th because there's never just one new unit, right? Um, so. I, don't, I don't think this is where the comment was going either, but nonprofits don't get a discount on property. You contribute to the schools. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Get pilot. That's a Yeah, I might. I, I just want to let you know. Okay, I asked him to send any questions or comments that we can address throughout. Perfect. Thank you, Aaron. That's great. All right. Um, land use and density, then. Can we wrap that up? All right. Seeing Josh. Uh, no. One, one comment. Oh, okay, Bernie. Are you hearing me well now? Um, not super well. No. It's really bad. Okay, I'll try. Um, the playground, I see a large light green area. Is all of that playground, or could some of it be just general green area with planting? I don't see the need for a play playground that's that big. That's that large light green area that wraps around the uh, left side of the building. Why does it have to be so big? Why can't some of it be a planting area? All right. What was the question? Can someone repeat? The, the concern was that the, uh, what the the green area shown on this plan to the rear of the site um, was going to be all playground, mm -hmm. and he would prefer a substantial mix of playground and other plantings. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you, Rob, for translating. Um, <laughs> I did not have a concern. All right. Thank you. All right, I will now wrap up land use and density. Great. Our next item on the agenda is site design and layout. We will start with site access and circulation. We're. Oh, I think, Rob, this might be a question for you, but do we have anything resembling a map of where the south side trail is likely to pass by this section? Or even can you describe it? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Um, the. Trail and if I missed segment, that in a, if I missed yeah. that in some slides, I'm sorry. The, uh, the trail segment, I think it's H, uh, is going to go directly along the ramp frontage. Okay. Uh, so it will, uh, along with the the portions that front um, the uh, Foreign Fair Center, will create a connection from George Mason Drive to uh, Glebe Road. Okay. And the county is actively working with. VDOT and um, the State Department on the uh, frontage adjacent to uh, that, <laughs> and this project uh, will substantially help um, anchor the, okay. the Glebe Road access. So, so we know that um, we know that the trail is not only going right by this, but that there's a lot of intercourse between. There's a potential for a lot of intercourse between this site and the trail. It's, Yes, we, and in fact, we've recommended that the daycare have its um, pedestrian and bicycle access from that trail connection rather than any internal circulation. Okay, I can I add just one more thing on this? Well, I've, I've, I've got a comment, so let me let me come back to that after a question. Okay, Commissioner Lund, tell me. Yeah, I'd like to follow up uh, from Commissioner Lund's discussion. Have we talked to VDOT at all about that? Ramp is pretty wide. Um, it's two effectively two lanes. Right. Is are two lanes really needed there? Is the queuing such that two lanes are needed to absorb that to keep it backing onto Ramp 15? Yes. And so there's there's layers to your question here. Um, we are working with VDOT to narrow the trail where possible. We don't think that that those activities um, can be directly coordinated with this land use decision. 
So we've recommended the, the full uh, clear width be accommodated within this plan so that we have a, an adequately wide trail. Uh, and then hopefully we'll get um, probably about 25 to 30 percent of the frontage um, may have some ramp narrowing. Um, we do think that VDOT's going to be very concerned about reducing the two lane section at the intersection. Um, and so that still represents a very substantial portion of this frontage. Uh, so we do believe that the combination of, of achieving um, a very uh, consistent uh, 10 to, to 13 foot um, trail section here, depending on what we how how we finalize the the two foot section, um, will will provide very good uh, width for for multi. Okay, so what you're saying is we may be able to nibble away part of the ramp away from the road. Because I understand why they want two lanes. That, that again, that's yes, pretty easy. But it just seems that the whole length of it is wider than it yet. It, we should at least question whether it needs to be wide all the way down to fit. That's all. So, so the county will work on that offline outside of the development process. The development process will uh, proffer or provide um, at, at least a minimum of what is needed. And I, I don't know if I may, um, Mike McCoskey with MICA um, is, is on here too. He's looked at this as well. Um, I, I'm shocked that VDOT would have a problem narrowing anything. Um, but Mike, do you want to talk about um, what, we, what, we, yeah, what we've looked at and your study as far as queuing and stuff? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, from a queuing perspective, um, there is no right turn on red um, here, so we are kind of stuck with that um, based on site distance. But from a queuing perspective, we're looking at about 135 feet for the left turn lane um, and about 275 feet for the right turn lane um, during the PM peak hour. Uh, so in theory, we could narrow the, the two lane section down to a approximately 145 feet so that we can still allow the right turn traffic to get past the queued left turn vehicles. Um, VDOT does have a minimum requirement for off ramps and that would be 16 feet. So uh, I believe the existing ramp width is just over 20 feet. So to the plan left there, um, we could redu potentially reduce the ramp, um, as I mentioned, to about halfway down the site. Which is about 150 feet. Maybe I'm gonna potentially. I'm gonna point, yeah, I'm gonna, potentially. I, I mean, I think that there's there's another level of thing things to think about is that Arlington County allows a very abrupt transition in adding lanes. A VDOT has a much narrower, a much um, longer transition when adding a lane, and so um, the ability to go to that full, you know, adding five feet. Um, will be achieved more gradually. Great. Let's go to the Transportation Commission, Mr. Weir, if you don't mind waiting. Um, can I, can I, are you calling on me? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Yes. Oh, OK, yeah. Uh, so before I get into my comments, I have a uh, couple questions. Some of them you've already kind of uh, addressed uh, right now, uh, right now with the previous question. Can you talk about more about the non vehicular circulation within the site? Like you, you, you mentioned that uh, specifically how pedestrians or people on bicycles might get to the uh, to the daycare center or or to the uh, the Goodwill store itself. I know you just mentioned right now the potential access from the trail. Is there anything else? In Mike, yeah, if you want to talk through site circulation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so there there or, is. Oh, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Which yeah, Mike? Mike, <laughs> Mike <laughs> go ahead. You're in person. <laughs> primary access points from the public way of pedestrian in bikes are the lower east corner where you have a priority elevated um, 
pedestrian bike way, bike racks, entrance to residential, entrance to retail. If you're coming from the north or the east, this is the safest place to draw people. If you're coming from the west, we'll have, um, and this ramp continues up, and that way it gives us opportunity for ADA access from this point to this entrance at this location to both the west entry to residential to the daycare. And that is from the 10 foot trail and it comes off here to give a separate ADA access in that location. We don't anticipate a lot of people coming perpendicular and they, <laughs> they do. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Mr. Murat Muratovich, do you have any other comments or questions? Yeah, yeah yes, yes. Um, I have a bunch actually, but um, uh, so you mentioned the uh, the bike racks. Do you have any more specific information <clears throat> at this stage? How many bike racks, whether you might have a bike room, uh, internal bike parking, yes, anything we'll have, like that? We will have an internal bike parking room and bike maintenance space in the garage right at the bottom of the access ramp and that will is designed to meet or exceed county code and we don't have details on the exterior bike ramp design or details mm -hmm. at this stage but we, we do have 64 bicycle parking spaces total so 54 of those are going to be class one spaces for residents 10 of them are going to be class three spaces for visitors so let me jump in here just for a minute so we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves we are going to talk about okay, transportation okay. at our next meeting. Okay, okay. So that will be a whole bullet point, and we're going to spend a lot of time on that. Leo, all I, right. I, 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 I want to point out that this this is a site circulation issue, right? Um, because I, I I just want to push back a little bit because I do have a point on on this that so I was just going to finish. Okay, sorry. Point, which is <laughs> site circulation conversation. So if we can if we can talk about the circulation where the bikes access the building, for instance, I think that's a little bit more uh, on topic. But um, Mr. Moradovich, if that if that provides you with any guidance on the comments that are for today versus, I think the layout of the bike room is a little bit more architecture and transportation at the next, when we have better plans, hopefully. Sure, sure. But with that, okay, okay. Um, you know, let's, let's keep you know, going. Let's... I, well, I mean, just, from from the entrance on the on the side, like just one point in terms of circulation, uh, it, it's, it seems kind of might be hard for people to figure out to w practically walk down an off ramp uh, to get to the daycare center. So I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I don't have any advice on how to how to resolve that, but that's going to be something that that's going to be a challenge. Um, can I talk about the? Uh, the parking, the surface parking, or are we going to save that for next week? Or I mean, or the next meeting? Definitely talk about surface parking as long as you couch it on something along access and circulation. <laughs> <laughs> Qualify it. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm I'm trying to figure out because my point was more to the uh, parking and curb space management element of the MTP. Um. That might be more for next week. I, I think oh, so. I mean, not 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 next week. Uh, the the next meeting we yeah, have. Right. Yeah, I think so. If that's okay yeah. with you, um, let's shelf that for now. I will say, if you do uh, have any comments on that, um, that you can share with staff. Um, time yeah. is of the essence, and we will be responsive to things that we get um, between now and then. Yes, that's a good point. Well, Thank you, Mr. Green. Well, how, how would you like me to share that? You want me to, to, to write you something or or tell you right now? Please email to Kevin. OK, uh, email Kevin. Yes, great. Can I just say too on the child care, just sort of close that that discussion point? Um, obviously, this is a narrow. It's a very narrow property, awkwardly kind of shaped. But when you have child care and, and Mr. Foster, you can correct me if I'm wrong. 
the outdoor open space needs to be at grade. Um, and so the only place that we can put the childcare really is at the back of the building. Um, and so I think it'll be intuitive. The our, our hope is that the vast majority of the users of the child care live in the building, but of course there'll be some that won't, um, and they will they, they will figure it out uh, how to get there. Um, right. It's no different than walking down a, a block. For that reason, we have, you know, what I think would be a gracious trail separated from the ramp by by street trees. Uh, go through and cover drop off for any vehicle drop off right. right in front of it. Let me go to Mr. Weir. You've been waiting. Yeah, long. another another question on. On this topic, I'm going to comment. Thank you. So, did I hear you correctly say that the, that a, the, a deliberate decision was made to avoid uh, um, a in, to avoid a, a, a bicycle-based option for uh, donations drop-off? No, okay. uh, that is not accurate. There's so, actually, it's not a it's not a deliberate decision not to. It is in fact a design decision to allow it. Okay. I just said, statistically speaking, of the hundreds and thousands of donations yeah. come, it turns out a very small percentage. Right. That, that might. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't no. mean to cut you off. No. Okay, so I, I I think I misheard you. Then I I I will say that right. We have to be wary of the inverse field of dreams rule. Right, if you don't build it, they will not come, and it's not enough to just allow it. There has to be a dedicated space for it, and we need. To, I, I really want the, the applicant, to, especially in a context like this, to remember that the e-cargo bike market is looking at somewhere between a 20 and 35 percent compound annual growth rate, growth rate over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So, if there is an option for a dedicated bike drop-off at the donation uh, area, I don't mean allowed. I mean dedicated, right? Protected. Then. That is something that we will absolutely see used, especially given its price. Right. So I'm going to stop high horsing and but thank you for the clarification. Yes. Executor. Dedicated ABA bicycle from the trail to the drop off. For donations drop off. For either. So if someone is if someone is bringing four bags of clothes, they're not going to have to share a lane with a motor vehicle. They will have to alternate and then leave like everybody else. Yes. I really hope that you be you look for opportunities to keep those boats separated uh, uh, in, in the next in the next design stage. Um, well, I understand the question and we'll study that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, we're going to hand it to Commissioner Guevara, but I'm just going to give it to Mr. Muradovich. If you have to add, you want to add anything to what we're doing? Yeah, just yeah. just a general point about circulation. So I'll be uh, I'll be uh, sending my email as well. But in terms of circulation, I really understand why uh, uh, why the applicant wants to basically have a drive-through uh, setup for um, for dropping off uh, donations and, and, and whatnot. It makes a lot of sense from that perspective. But if we zoom out in terms of the county interest, in terms of where the master transportation plan is right now, and it's already a dated master tra transportation plan in many uh, ways, uh, there's um, going to hopefully we're going to be having a new one soon. It's kind of incongruent with the existing one and going to be even more incongruent with uh, the direction where the county's going. And I understand narrow sight, uh, all of these things, but Goodwill has, uh, I looked it up, six locations in, on Manhattan, and they make it work somehow. And, um, and I understand why this will be easier for them, but I hope that we um, will come to a conclusion, uh, come, to a, come to some type of consensus that's beneficial for both of us. Uh, and I'll be emailing my comments on uh, perhaps uh, how to do that, but I mean, having a uh, drive-through uh, is is not really congruent with the goals of the county from a transportation perspective. Um, so, so that's that. Uh, but Great. overall, plenty of positive things with this site as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenbridge. Commissioner Guevara. Well, I know we've been discussing quite a bit, but uh, I do want to go back and say how thankful I am that we are. Um, try to increase housing and, and thank you for uh, particularly affordable housing. 
Um, having said that, and I know earlier you mentioned, sir, um, that this is very car centric, particularly because donations come this way. But again, with the inverse field of dreams, I think it's really important that we do go back and make this a little more pedestrian friendly. And I am really questioning whether we do need those parking spots right in front. And I'm wondering if perhaps if we move them to the back, if they're absolutely necessary. I, I do understand that perhaps uh, for some disabilities, some people may need outside parking. But if we lessen the number of them, if perhaps we move the building a little bit closer to the front, or instead of having that right up front, I, I just wonder if it'll make it more pedestrian friendly because I can't see how, you know, it'll be difficult for someone to cross right up front. Um, you're going to have bicyclists going there. Um, I understand that you mentioned that, you know, you could have zero parking spots available or but let's say the technology, you know, it could be out, the light could go out. Sometimes people could still try to come in and out, shortcut it, or maybe they think, hey, this is the drop off. Maybe there's more parking in the back if I try to cut around and or maybe with the childcare, maybe they think all the way in the back, there's more parking. I just think there could be more chances for there to be backups and for the traffic to actually back up in South Cliff Road. And so I'm wondering if we eliminate those parkings up front, it'll kind of eliminate some of that um, desire for people to and create some of um, additional um, uh, potential traffic um, backups that could uh, come from that. Yeah, I think this is a good let me, I'm going to recognize both Catherine and Dawn from Goodwill and then make maybe Mike Minkowski, um, because this is this one issue. This singular issue has probably dominated the majority of our conversations with staff. Again, we continue to meet with them to try to find ways to solve to sort of thread that needle. It is important from Goodwill's organizational mission. Um, so, Catherine, I'm going to turn it to you. First of all, thank you for um, your comments and for everyone's comments. And, you know, I have to tell you, we have been there. At this location for uh since uh the, the 1990s and i will say to dawn's credit this site which handles so much um has really been effectively used when we started this whole process four years ago we, i must go ahead and i must tell you i'm the reason and i will stand by this is that our mission is to serve people with severe disabilities and people who have barriers to employment. Now, let me just say barriers to employment are child care and housing. So joining with AHC for child care and housing, we are meeting our mission and growing that mission in Arlington County. But the one thing of it is that we must have is we must have access to the building for people who have disabilities. And so therefore, I will say, the front of the building where they can actually have physical access to go right into the building into our retail store is very important. Um, right now we have actually five spaces that are accessible to that front door. And I will say that I believe that if we do everything and we don't do that, we will be not, first of all, addressing our mission, and people who have disabilities will, in fact, go ahead and say, what happened? Why are you not fulfilling your mission in that way? And so that is why when we were looking at this and you all, uh, you know, the idea of greener space and what have you, there was much discussion about could we eliminate space, spaces? And if you notice from the very beginning, we did eliminate those that is closest to Glebe Road. The people who have severe disabilities, which is people that we do honor and we respect and we invite and we want them to be have access to the store. That is why we have been quite frankly insistent that we go ahead and address and keep our mission front and center, which it is front and center when it is there next to the building in front of the store. I don't know, Mike Pinkoski, if you want to add, or you have anything to add about, about conflicts, safety or anything like that, because that's also been an issue we've discussed. Yeah, sure. I would just add that, you know, um, since 
with it being a retail space, you know, the typical turnover of a parking space for retail is somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour. So if we're thinking about seven spaces and, you know, the vehicular turnover of those spaces during a peak period, you know, we're looking at maybe seven, maximum 14 movements. Um, there would be signage at the crosswalk. Um, the driveway itself, um, from a travel perspective, is 28 feet wide, so there is adequate space for a vehicle to back up. There would be no other traffic coming eastbound to exit except for the people leaving those spaces. Um, thanks, so, thanks, Mike. I'm, yeah. uh, let me finish up with Commissioner Guevara. So I actually uh, grew up in South Arlington, <laughs> and I remember growing up going to that kind of well. It's, it's, it's really funny. And it, it was really interesting. I would love going there with my mom in the weekends and I would run around the aisles. It was really great. And, um, you know, I actually have a disability too. Um, that you, you really can't see. Um, so it's really interesting. And I'm so glad you mentioned about the mission and, um, and I am actually really thankful. Um, but, and, and I understand, um, the need, you know, to wanting for there to be inclusive inclusivity, because that's something that's really dear for me too. Um, and not that I want to push back or anything like that, but but what I think is great about the mission is not necessarily embedded in the parking and that there's parking at the front, but rather the opportunities and the inclusivity that it provides people when you walk in and that there's something that is affordable that you can find something that's vintage. And whether it was when I was a child and running around and it was finding something or whether it's now and you want to find something that's vintage and you could resell, you know, on a platform online. And so um, perhaps putting it on the side, you know, that it's not where you have to go into on the right side of where you have to actually drive, drive it in. Uh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, where are you? You can point with the. Uh, yeah, where you have to drive in here, but actually right up front where the curb cut is, and you could see you could see the spaces right in. You don't even have to go all the way to, in and make the right. You could see the spaces right there. Um, I'm just wondering if there's more if there's more ingenious ways to do it. I think we would certainly look at everything that we you can, but I and <laughs> no, 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 but there's no buts here. And I, 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 I first of all, I appreciate you all hearing the reason for it. Of course, it, it, it's you know, it's parking spaces, but it's not it, it's not parking spaces. It really is uh, spaces that will be able to um, address people who have a. Uh, differing abilities. And as you so well said, you know, we not everyone, you cannot see people's um, differing abilities. You can't. But we can go ahead and give them as much access to our stores as possible. Okay. And so that's that's why. That's the Great. that's the thing behind the space. Yeah. Great. Can I add a point to it? Absolutely. Just from the standpoint of, of operationally and I I Thank you for being, because that was courageous what you just didn't sharing, and thank you for that. <clears throat> Something we can't control, which but it it does tie into this. We do have a lot of patrons that are frustrated that there aren't enough accessible spaces for the quantity of folks that require them. And so to remove them, it would be that would be very difficult. Um, those individuals. Can I just clarify? So I, I don't think the suggestion is to remove them. And I think it's just to put up in the garage, which if I understand it, they have to be fully ADA accessible. So I, I, I'm a little bit confused as to what the penalty would be for the ADA accessibility issue by undergrounding those parking. So I'll be finished. It says. Yeah. Beyond wheelchairs and physical mobile disabilities, so we are also adding those and others to be most inclusive. Because under the ADA law, as you know, wheelchair and physical 
is a small percentage of the disabilities that are covered under the law. Garages, phobias, claustrophobia, elevators are challenging for some people and a, a Goodwill works with thousands and thousands of people for employment opportunities, most of which have mental, emotional, physical disabilities in the hospitality, janitorial uh, service industries. And it's not this or that, it's this and that. It's all of the above and more. Great, thanks. Um, I'm gonna go clockwise, so Mr. Streiner. So this is a departure. I wanted to hear staff's take on the two foot trenches back to the trail. Um, back to the trail. <laughs> and so, and so, because I mean, that to me, that looks a little narrow. I know ideally, you know, the staff presentation, there was a 10 foot trail with five on each side. Now there's like a 16 foot total, 10 foot trail, but four on one side, and two on the other. And I wanted to hear staff's take is that viable? Is it enough space? You know, where did you all see on that? So, staff still is digesting some of this um, as the applicant has been very responsive. Right. Um, and just very briefly, I think we have the same questions you have. We'll provide more information at the transportation center. Sounds great. great. Uh, I'll go to Pam, and then I have three people online, and then I'll go <laughs> to Alex. Alex, and then I'll go to Commissioner Weir. All right, Pam, oh, you're This next. is a huge topic. <laughs> and, then, and, and I don't need answers now. I want to ask questions now, and maybe you can provide things for next time. Uh, I'm interested in pedestrian circulation, but not just people coming into the site, but the people who live there. Uh, one of my main questions always with a building is how do the residents get out of the building? Not just uh, where are the stairs, what happens when they, when they come out of the stairwell, and where do they go from there? Uh, so I would like to see a layout for that, how they get in and out of the retail unit, how they get, if they're Parking at the garage, how, how do they walk out of the garage? How do they get, get in and out of the child care center? Uh, different ways we're doing drop off. And also, you know, for bikes, how do they do it? We, we're doing a good job of how people drive, but we don't have layouts on how people walk, especially the residents. How, how do they get out of the building safely? And where do they go? Where does it land? Where do they go? Chris, am I right? that you've eliminated a lot of the sidewalks that were next to the building in your current plans? Yes, per some of the comments. Yeah, on, on the south side, there probably what, never was much of there it, but on the much. north side, it got down in your latest thing, it's down to like three and a half feet. It's like, oh. that's useless. <laughs> as, I, as I mentioned, that three and a half feet was never intended and will never be a sidewalk. It will be a planter bed or a vertical biophilia wall on that north facade. Good. <laughs> that issue, given the site grades, that grade is seven and a half to eight percent, which is not ADA accessible. So we don't want to build a sidewalk that looks accessible so that somebody can be bent of a misunderstanding and that it is not. So by going out longer on the perimeter, the grade further away at the bike trail. Uh, reduces the severity of that flow. Am I correct that by eliminating the sidewalks by the building, the only east-west access for pedestrians is on the trail? It is from the trail, but it does not cross the drive lane. It right. is from the trail on the northwest side corner, as opposed to the walkway on the southeast Corner. You're getting, you're perceiving yeah. it correct. Yeah. So, so if someone was leaving the child care center, they would walk across this and go over to the trail and then go wherever they want to go. Correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah it's right next that to would the be trail. Safe. Yes. Yes. But there's no cross of traffic at that location. Right. No, really. Although the, the trail is quite busy. You really have to watch out for cyclists and stuff. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. When I checked right. it out the other day, I almost yeah. got hit by one. Yeah, Okay, is that it, Pam? Yeah, uh, I'm, well, I'm going to start cracking down a yeah. little bit. If we're running a little late, but yes, sir. I want to make sure you're heard. Yes, sir. Yeah, That's good for now. Thank you. All right, we're going online and then we're going to come back to the room. Online, Commissioner Berkey, you're on. Commute, please. <laughs> 
All right, we're gonna. All right, we'll go to Steve Kleppen. Hi, uh, good evening again. Um, going to circulation, looking at the donation drop off and the child care drop off. Uh, you know, part of me with uh, you know a bunch of military experience, uh, force protection, security manager stuff. I'm looking at kids getting dropped off next to. I, I'm not talking about pedestrian issues. I'm talking about um, you know vulnerable population issues. And when we look at you know children being dropped off right next to a bunch of strange vehicles passing by and whatnot. I mean, is there any consideration to that? I, I I've never dropped a kid off of child care, uh, full disclosure, but just any comments on that uh, would be great. All right. Yeah. Um, we'll let Mr. Yes. Hoffman that. Those two drop-offs have separate doors and are segregated by a mesh screen. So there is no vulnerability exposure. And at any time there's a child drop-off, it will be staffed by the child care center. At any time, there is a drop off for goodwill. There'll be multiple staff present. All of the above are secured and separated by a open air, but security screen between them for that reason. Thank you, Mr. Foster. All right, uh, Commissioner Berkey, are you able to speak now? Yeah, sorry, yeah. for some reason I got, I got kicked out of the meeting. Um, so I, I appreciate the conversation that uh, Commissioner Guevara was um, surfacing about the surface parking, and I'd like to revisit that because I'm, I'm just still not quite understanding. And so I'd I really appreciate some greater detail from the applicant. Have you all had like experience with other um, properties? I'm imagining this is sort of a unique one for you, um, but I, I'd like to learn more about why it's imperative to have the surface parking versus the garage. And I'll, I'll preface my, my question by saying, I, I, I really think everybody at this meeting uh, would care deeply about you know, the needs of the folks that you're trying to serve and, and patronize the store. So I really do think that that should be a given. And um, the other you know, point that I, I've had is that we've had lots of other um, developments in Arlington where there is no surface parking and we've had a lot of accessibility within garages and to my knowledge haven't seemed to have had a big issue with that. And so I just really want to dive deeper into why you think this is essential to the project, because I think, as you can tell, there are a lot of us, myself included, for whom this is not just a, a trivial issue. It's a, it's a pretty big safety issue we're concerned about and staff is flagged. So if you don't mind just speaking more to that and why specifically a garage is not sufficient. That'd be appreciated. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I'll go ahead and uh, Dawn, you can. Uh, first of all, as far as uh, I would say, we have 20, well, we do have 21 stores and accessible uh, parking for people with uh, disabilities is always paramount and front and center. Um, that's, that is the first thing. The second thing is, is that there are um, many people who, uh, by access, a garage is very difficult. We are a nonprofit who addresses people with severe disabilities. And so when I, and I, I understand what you said, sir, about some buildings don't have it, but some buildings are not goodwill and that's our mission. That's the real part here is that this right here is who we address, how we address them, and with the respect that we give. And I know you all respect the people who we serve, and that's not even in question, but it is because of who we are as a nonprofit, who we serve, that we must put those people's needs paramount. And that is why giving them access to the front of the building and not having them to go down into the garage to come up through an elevator is the respect that we feel we need to continue to do, which the property currently allows us to do. Great. Thank you. Are you putting your hand? No, up? I, I All right. like to add something. Yeah, because I, I do think that it's important to, to highlight this now. Um, staff is, is hearing all of this, and from a transportation perspective, we are 
um, very much in that court, but we are also looking at it. Um, there are layers of people who are served here. Um, they are not just the the constituents of the goodwill. Um, there will be a new residential population on this site. Um, this is a unique location. I'm just stating facts. I'm not trying to argue for or against. This location does not have a it does not have on street parking within a few hundred feet, if that, of this location. Um, so there are differences in this location than you would see in our urban core. I don't have a. Um, I, I'm only trying to present facts, not project a, a solution to that. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Um, I'm going to go for the last person online and then we'll come back to the room. Mr. Muradovich. Yes, yes, yeah, cir circulation issue and one that many have commented on as well. Um, I understand uh, the uh, the paramount focus on individuals with uh, with disabilities, uh, but also individuals with disabilities move in other ways other than uh, cars. And uh, the master transportation plan specifically states that it discourages off street parking, particularly when it is located between a curb and a building face, which is what we have right here. Now, if that off street parking were, if that building were pushed more to the front and that off street parking were moved to the side or to the back, as in some of the other cases, that issue would be resolved. But right now, what we have is because of roughly uh, five spots, everyone is going to have to compete coming out of that building. Uh, is going to the residents of the uh, 120 plus units in the childcare. Uh, people, when they're across the street, they're going to have to compete with cars. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis. I feel that conflict could be resolved if that surface parking was moved uh, to the side somehow. You would need to rejig the site a bit, but I mean, the, the, uh, the master transportation plan is pretty clear. Uh, that this type of parking situation is, uh, is is strongly discouraged, and uh, it provides a whole page of reasons why that's the case. It's on page 15 of the uh, parking and curb space management element. I'm not going to go through all of it, and so this is uh, something that I hope we can uh, work forward to resolving the unique nature of this site, and uh, but also keep it in accordance with the uh, the broader county goals and right. making it as accessible for the all the other uses of this building. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moradovich. Um, I will make a quick comment, which is going to be a little heavy, and I haven't spoken yet tonight, so I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on this. Um, I believe that using the, the diagram that's there today right, is not the best solution for this site. I think I think the diagram works well today. I respect the innovate, innovative use of the parking lot and the building and, and what they've done with it. But I honestly believe that if we push the building up to the northeast corner, completely um, do the good urban gesture, and then create surface parking, you know, as Mr. Muradovich just mentioned, on the south side of it, and then also segregate the, the semis so that the semis go to the very end, and then all delivery, uh, both child delivery, which, okay, that came out wrong, um, <laughs> kid drop off, um, and the, the, the goodwill drop off. Um, you know, could go underground. And I think, you know, given that we don't have to build, um, I, I want to flag also another issue, which is that retaining wall is not an inexpensive gesture, right? We all know retaining walls are very pricey. Um, and so by eliminating the retaining wall, incorporating that into the underground garage, we could expand the garage a little bit, perhaps make the aisles a little wider so that we can accommodate some of these uses underground and create um, a little bit more of a sort of less car centric um, um, layout on the site. Having said that, I will stop talking and go over to Ms. No, actually, we're just going to go clockwise as my new method. So, Mr. Steven Sanders. Sorry, Sanders. Sanders. Yes. Uh, I do not have a question about traffic or circulation. Uh, right. My my question is on the site currently. There is a small group of trees to kind of uh, toward the back of the site. Do you all plan on clearing the entire site or? Some of these images suggest that there are going to be trees back there. Do you expect to clear the entire site and work entirely within the, the boundaries, or do you plan on keeping those back there? No, we don't. We don't. Um, we plan to put a tree in this morning now. We'll have more details on that. 
but as that site slows up, slopes up to meet the adjacent site on the government property, we'd really like to keep those trees preserved as many as possible and run a, uh, a fence, which is there now, but would just improve its aesthetic. Um, but it extent it's ours uh, on that perimeter. And then as that tapers down, we'll need to level out the area by code. Because right now it's it's a rolling topography, but we have to make it level per code for child care to open directly onto that. And then we'll balance the minimum requirements for child care with the maximum opportunities for tree preservation. Uh, all my other questions already been answered. Great. Thank you, Mr. So Sanders. I understand. Yeah. So at your current site, you have the dedicated parking for people with needs yes. and you run out of it. We do. It's very, it's very popular. So is that because there are some people that are coming and parking and really shouldn't be in those spaces? Or no. You police it it, we, we, yes. So my question is, will you have enough of those spaces? With well, because there are seven spaces there. So there's seven. We now have five. And we're going to have those. And then we would have in the garage, as uh, Mike said, I just said we would have all, uh, additional ones. So we do feel that that, that that will take care of a population who we serve that come to shop there. Yeah, now when people come up now and they're going to see those spaces, signs and everything, you know, having to release it or because of the. Do, do you know, I, I will say this. I think, yes, I, I think that, um, I think people are respectful of um, this, the limited space and that when it says that it is for uh, a person with a disability, they don't take advantage. We don't find that, as, that doesn't seem to be enough. Uh, yes, I think so. Great, thank you, Commissioner Bagley. Anything else? Yeah. No, not right now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. Going around here, doing my arm swing. <laughs> Mr. Irwin, tell me. Yeah. Um, this is a hard one because I'm normally against restricted parking. Um, I want to minimize it wherever possible. But I also recognize that this is outside the metro corridors. And we've just gone through the whole exercise with the Plan Lakes and Boulevard where we did acknowledge explicitly that service parking is, continues to be an option for redevelopment of sites along the boulevard there. That will That is now in the plan that has been adopted by the board. That said, he also wants that parking to be, if it's going to be surfaced, on the sides or in the back, rather than right, right in the front. So, you know, this, this tent goes in full in different directions. Um, daycare is great. Having drop kids off, have, having it sheltered really makes a difference. So I'm very happy that it's going to be that way. Having it in the back there is a great place for it, especially in this neighborhood. Having the daycare center toward the front doesn't work because the kids normally take the kids out walking on the streets. These are not streets where you want to have a bunch of little kids walking along. So having it in the back there where the trees are, there's no traffic back there. That works very well. I think that's good for site Um If I would love to have a different way of having that parking, having it be on the side if possible, as mentioned here, that would be ideal. Whether it's possible, I don't know. But if we could take those spots those surface spots and put them somewhere on the side, that would be a win. If it means maybe moving the building closer to Glebe and then shrinking it on the side somehow, because there's a bit of a jog in it, I don't know. Um, you know, but if, if there's some creative way to do that, I'd love to see that if possible. Acknowledging though that a drive-through is going to be necessary, period. Um, this isn't like a bank drive-through, which I think is sort of do discourage and I continue to discourage. I'm mean, not even thrilled with McDonald's drive throughs um, <laughs> and the Walgreens drive throughs but here it is necessary. That's the whole point of it. People will, you know, maybe in Manhattan people do. I lived in New York City, so I know, I know. There's creative ways of getting around, but we're not that creative here at all at this point. So most of our people, and I drop off stuff like three times a year at this site. And over the years, it's gotten way more efficient. You're now in and out, and for me, literally seconds. Um, it's really efficient. 
Um, so it has improved, so I expect it will improve even further because you're doing a great job on that. Because of that, I'm happy to have, I'm willing to have the drive through continue there. We need to have circulation through it. If there's alternatives to it, that's fine, but having it sheltered is great because the more people go on rainy days, so spread it out further. Um, not everybody just come on the one sunny day. So, you know, all of those things in my mind tip toward, yeah, a drive through is appropriate here. We need to have some surface parking if we can accommodate it in the right place. Um, it's not ideal for this county the way we go. And uh, Commissioner Muradovic is right. Our MTP strongly <laughs> discourages a lot of these things. But you know, it's not an absolute ban. It's pretty much this is hortatory. This is the way we want to go. I think Goodwill has made a very good argument that they are an honest to God exception that we have to take that into account in figuring out how circulation and how cars are going to be accommodated here. So anyway, that's that's my. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Tell me, Commissioner Greer. I have two very quick questions and one hopefully medium question. Can we go back to the slide from your presentation on the trauma informed design? I just want to see that real quickly. Yes. <clears throat> Which flips got it. The, the, yeah. the loop. Got it. Yes. All right. I, I meant to point this out earlier. I love that this is in your deck. I love that you're thinking about this. Thank you. It's not in the deck online. So could we please get the deck online updated to include this? I've already told three different people about it. And then I went and noticed that it wasn't there. Oh. Um, I think that yeah. this is this is an, a way of thinking about design that I think is probably new to most of the people on the commission, probably nearly all. Um, and I really look forward to hearing more about this as we proceed. Thank you. Um, second quick question. Am I reading the maps right, especially on, uh, I guess, slides? The slides themselves aren't numbered and I'm, I'm in a browser, so probably the, the ground level plan and level one plan on the applicant's presentation. Am I reading this right that only four of the seven currently proposed spots are going to be marked as uh, accessible? Parking. Four, they'll be marked. Four of them will be marked for wheelchair accessibility. Okay. The others are for a broad range of, dis of accessibilities, which will not be specified. So, someone like me, whose only disabilities are neurodevelopmental, <laughs> uh, um, would uh, there would be something indicating to me that this is not for you? Is that correct? Are you going to tow my car? The right answer is yes, if I park there. <laughs> I personally guarantee you I will not tow your car. But that's a policy decision, but I do understand your point. I, I think that what we're hearing um, from Goodwill, uh, if taken to its conclusion, means that we're going to need to see if, if, if the Planning Commission is, were to recommend something consistent with this, I think the Planning Commission would need to see it in connection with a, a condition that there be program, programmatic limitations on who can use those other surface parking spots. Uh, and if there is not a need for that many, then we talk about whether or not six is the right number. Look, it's, I was at Harris Teeter today. They have signs that are not for the handicapped, but they have signs for um, Veterans, they have signed, they have also seen parking the signs for uh, pregnant people. Um, right. That, and those generally are left alone. Yeah. Um, so having a sign for someone with a simply, you could come up with something to describe it, right? someone with a, if they're a client. disability or something, well, for those other things at the sign there. I'm making a, I'm making a People sense. probably, <laughs> as you've mentioned, probably respect that. Okay. I've seen people do respect those signs in other parking lots here in the county. And I don't think that we need to work that out here. I, right. I don't even know that you necessarily would want to respond to it here because we're going to talk about this more, but. Well, I'm, you are correct. I got the sense we're going to talk about it a lot for a long time, <laughs> forever. Hopefully and, not. But. Yeah. There are also legal definitions that address disabilities of all types, including disabilities that people aren't comfortable talking about, right. especially if they have them. And as Catherine so 
aptly said, I do think we can address um, that in policy and signage. I have no idea how to write it in a site plan. I've written hundreds of these things, and I am, I'm worrying about that because, you know, in my world, I've served on the board for 20 years of community residences. I serve on the board of community havens for adults with disabilities in Arlington and around. We design homeless shelters. A lot of our customer base are informed by traumatic experiences right. and the effect of that uh, for the people that have dealt with Homeland Security and PTSD. I can't list them all. All right, but, but they, they we need to find a way for these to be without being pejorative or getting into legal debates that it does send a message that it's and and we will have to look at how to do that. I'm not the wordsmith attorney, but I do see the enormity and I assure you in this place, seven or ten will never be enough. Yeah. But we've had to get it down to something that gave us a buffer to mitigate <coughs> other balancing like retaining walls, landscape, urban design, interface of urban rail. This project's got every opportunity to explore nuance that you can imagine. My my biggest concern before I before I go to my third point is that you know it, if if we're here if we're here discussing at this extent about four versus seven, right? I don't want people like Daniel Weir, who are perfectly able to park in the garage, taking up storefront curbside right. surface parking. And and if you know if what we need are four dedicated marked spots, then we have other per reason. There, we have other county goals for those for the square footage that those other three spots are taking up. And so if we're gonna have to think going to have to think of something that 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 me that that keeps a good man honest right uh about whether or not to use those three spots um those are special needs yeah very fair i can i can I, I can this up in a bit so i, I still mind you you have one more point yep all right take it away so uh <laughs> look, looking at the very very southern point of this i'm, I'm really concerned that we're you know, there is, I think people are right. We're talking about how oh, there's too much asphalt on this site. And I think that they're also looking at the southern corner. This looks like there's at least a thousand square feet of of paved land here that just based on the circulation arrows there that doesn't need to be paved. Um, I, I am especially concerned that you're teeing yourself up to preserve the present condition where people are not uh exactly where people are not turning back up to the northeast to go on the glebe but instead continuing to the southeast uh um which you know presently people use the parking lot behind the building to the south as a road i'm guilty of it um i would like to see at a minimum grass and median uh separating um the restricting preventing vehicles from from exiting the site to the to the southeast uh, but ideally uh, based on those arrows, there's there's too much asphalt there, and that's a consistent problem with the site. So I think that you've got some room to work with on, on that corner. This is a yep. I would love to do that. I would love to do that. The line is here, mm -hmm. and there's an easement here, and that'll be a great conversation when this gets redeveloped. Mm -hmm. And I'm desperately hopeful that it'll be soon. Mm -hmm. I actually know the people and I'm proposing them to do it. So that, that'd be good for all of us. Right now, it's a lot less than you think. That's on our property. The other is a shared access easement that they have across our property. Mm -hmm. And we okay. can't touch it if we try. Okay. Well, that's a non start. That's that. And they have shut us down. Yeah. I okay. tried. All right. Thanks for thanks for the thanks for I'm sorry to hear that, but that's has nothing well, to do with it's you. A <laughs> we want to help solve that sooner than later. It won't be in the next. We did, we did reach out to them because also as far as truck turning move and stuff like that, being able to use their utilize their property versus having to do it all on our property. The answer was no. Okay. Well, I'm I'm relieved to hear that y'all have been looking at it. I'm sorry to hear that 
this situation is what the situation will solve itself in due time. Good. It just won't be this way. All right, I'm going to jump in here. Um, I'm just going to do a quick reminder. We're on item two of our agenda for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think this is the item that is the most worthy, so I don't have a problem with us being uh, late. I just want to say that there's about 10 minutes left and uh, nine minutes left. We have. Um, I just want to check with everyone that everyone feels somewhat confident or comfortable with the idea of we've talked about site access and circulation. We road frontage, which has been part of this conversation off ramp frontage. Um, I don't know that we covered that too much. I think Mr. Strander mentioned the trail. I'm a little concerned about the sort of um, roadway trail, sort of a little bit of a mini canyon effect. Yeah. I'm not convinced that that's a, a really good, um, you know, speaking of people and safety and this concern of like, you know, one of the things that we do with buildings up on the street, just to cover this fundamental, um, is also safety and that sense of, um, you know, mental health almost, where you, you don't feel like you're threatened, you don't feel like you're in danger, you don't feel like you're standing there on an island, right? So I, I'm a little nervous about this trail, the quality of the trail when it's all said and done. I'm a little nervous about the front of the pedestrians on the sidewalk and how they're gonna be stressed out by the fact that to their left there's cars, to their right there's cars, there's cars crossing in front of them, there's cars crossing behind them. You know, it just becomes, there's no respite from that vehicular movement aspect. So um, just keep that in mind as you continue to design the site. Um, I, um, and then um, I got a little sidetracked there. Um, the other point, comment is building height and form and architecture. I really wanted to get that in comments. Um, if, if anyone has any comments that we can make quickly for the for the design team, Pam, you're on. That's just a circulation comment. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> I know. I, I guess we didn't get to it. Uh, the for driving uh, over to the pass through, it's just one lane wide. And my concern is the child care drop off versus the people dropping off stuff and the people who are dropping off their kids or picking up their kids are going to be under really tight time constraints and, and are not going to want to be in the same queue as people dropping stuff off. And what is your solution for that, sir? Well, uh, and we go into detail on in the next meeting. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted, that, to, I just wanted we, to raise we, it. We will address that. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rob. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Um, all right, Kate. Yes, real quickly on a totally different topic. Um, when I was looking at the slides, it seems like there is just an enormous amount of space on that road. And we're talking about, especially for the residents, for them to be able to have more access to open air. I mean, there just isn't, you don't, you've done a lot, but you've done, you know, with your community room on the top and with the child care, but there's just not a lot to work with on that site. I appreciate what you have done with it. And I do think the project is great, but it seems like the roof is kind of a, a, a resource that isn't really being used. And it's, you know, I know we'll talk about biophilia because that's kind of like my thing on the next time. But if you considered um, having like planter boxes up there, I mean, if you did something like this, you'd have to consider the load bearing and all that. But maybe even just like little raised beds where residents could go up and grow some herbs and do that kind of thing, or just to have some space up there. Even if you decided no, for whatever reasons, we don't want to allow access up there, having some kind of plantings up there would at least, you know, help with the whole biophilia and the rainwater. Yeah. yeah. To mention it in my limited time in a presentation, but given the east-west orientation and the fact to the south, there is no fit, nothing blocking it, are likely to in sun. We anticipate, and it's designed, I think we've showed it on previous slides, that we see a photovoltaic array, and we might elevate that. We, did, we designed these buildings to be ready for it because it's hard to commit that much in advance. We did that with the Apex, with AHC, and they're now photovoltaic panels on that went on within a year of completion. And we have every every hope to have that infrastructure in place. And that is how we would like to use that roof. Can I jump in here? So we yeah. will be talking about um, E2C2 talking issues and the roof and the landscaping. So we will cover that. For okay. time. I really wanted to do a quick touch base on architecture. Um, Nia, did you want to say something? Perfect. You go first. I just want to. Thank and congratulate the team for doing things. I understand the nod to 
the logo and the theme and everything, but I, I thought that I think this is a better approach. I appreciate it. That's into consideration. It's a much better looking building. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, go to you. Okay. Yeah, just um, Joan Mack and I with C2E2, the Climate Change, Energy, and Environment Commission. So, um, you know, very grateful that you're really including environment as part of some of the core principles for design. I don't think we see that enough. Um, in terms of the design specific, you made reference, um, maybe a little bit more specifics in terms of selection of the materials um, and maybe even orientation. I know you're looking at the well, window ratio is, is one of the key elements of yes. allowing for energy efficiency. And then you kind of sum up of, you know, kind of what 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 you're doing in these selections, um, just both for kind of the insulative envelope as well as actually lower carbon, because certainly there's now growing options for lower carbon materials um, as, as you're building the building and, and how that kind of um, lends itself in terms of some of your sustainability elements. One of my favorite topics. I look forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Tony, brief. I love the aesthetic. Not a lot of the buildings we have around here are bright, cheery, colorful, great dark, gray, black buildings. So this is very refreshing. So I want to put that out there. I love the yellow. Jim? I think this is good because it looks like a market rate building. Hmm. That's really important. Right. We're building four ones. That's wonderful. I will say though that the last iteration of Rubio, I personally thought it, <laughs> I thought yeah. it actually gave almost a nod to the late lamented Blue Goose building. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was a fun design. So I did not have a problem with the last one. But this also is very sophisticated. So fine. Great. Um, I don't see any hands up. I'll, I'll just say that I, I really like how your design kind of breaks up the bulk of the building. Uh, you did a nice job of different design. That really helps. Thank you very much. Great. I'll associate myself with that comment. I think that the mass breakdown is good. I, unlike Commissioner Lynn Tell me, was not super fond of the, the blue goose, as it's been called. <laughs> um, and I appreciate um, the design team responding to the comments, you know, 95 or, or however many you responded to. Um, and I think, you know, uh, keep up the good work. We will keep supporting you as much as we can. Please revisit or, or you know, um, be willing to look at some of the issues that we've brought up and that we've commented. I think there is uh, a lot of merit on, on some of the community comments. And with that, I will ask if anyone has any last closing comments. We yeah, have no say, public comments. Because everybody is involved in it. And so mm -hmm. it's, you know, we started this whole thing. So I'd like to just say thank you. And we thank you too. Just a second, everybody. Um, Hang on, Mr. Byrne wants to speak. Dr. Byrne? Yes, um, if you could hear me. For the next yes. meeting, I would like to see your um, landscape plan with all the species of plants listed. Uh, this should have been in the original submission. It was not. So I want to know what pollinators will be there, what uh, perennials, things like that, as well as the species of trees. I haven't seen this yet. Uh, the, the second thing is that I would really like to see common milkweed or something with Periaka there appear to all these meetings because that plant is what feeds the monarch or the county has a monarch butterflies and that plant is what in the monarch of the islands and the board has a monarch plant. So I want to see, but I want to see that plant list at the next meeting. Uh, I don't see it now. I have no idea what you're planning to plant, but we need that. All right. Thank you, Bernie. I think I heard a landscape plan yes. and a yes. planting selection plan. That's Pollinators. Okay. Pollinate with pollinators. Yes. Oh, exactly. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Thanks, everyone. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.